In John chapter 17, we have in front of us one of the most unique passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. It's the only place where we have an extended prayer of Jesus. There's plenty of other places, sometimes in the Old Testament, speaking prophetically. Sometimes in the New Testament, Jesus giving a little snippet of prayer. But John 17 is the only example we have of an extended prayer of our Savior. And it reveals something important that we need to connect with here this morning and in these weeks that we're studying this prayer. You see, because here's the truth of it. Jesus didn't only pray for those 11 disciples on that night. Now, next week, we're going to see specifically the things that Jesus prayed for the disciples that would come after them. But when Jesus prayed his will for those 11, he's also reflecting his will for us because we are his disciples. And Jesus prays for us even now. The Bible says that Jesus lives evermore to make intercession for his people. Jesus is praying for his people. And this is the heart and the mind with which he prays for them. So now let's take a look at verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. There's something so different about the way that Jesus prays. He prays with a connection to spiritual realities, things that aren't yet true in the natural, but are already true in the spiritual. What do I mean? Look at the way he begins that prayer in verse 11. He says simply, now I am no longer in the world. Would you blame one of his disciples for interrupting that prayer? Say, Jesus, excuse me, sorry. Looks like you're right here with us now. I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. But do you see that Jesus, when he prayed, he was in such a mind and such a heart that he could connect with a spiritual reality that Jesus, in his heart and his mind, what he was going to accomplish at the cross, through the empty tomb, and ascending to heaven, it was so certain, it was so already spelled out in his heart and in the plan of God that it was done. He could see it as completed, even though it was not yet actually completed. And knowing this, he prays for those disciples who would be left in the world. And what does he pray? Look at verse 11. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. Jesus in this prayer, when he begins to ask God the Father to do specific things for his children, he prays for his disciples, Father, keep them and keep them through your name. They had to be kept. They had to continue on as the disciples of Jesus. Friends, I want you to understand and just get in touch with the fact that that's not immediately obvious that they would do so. Do do you understand that in the days of Jesus, for a rabbi or a master to have disciples and to tour around and to train those disciples, it was not an unusual thing. Jesus was not the only rabbi going around the region of Galilee and Judea with a bunch of disciples that he taught. That happened many times. That was the way people got what we might call today a seminary education. That's how they learned to be a rabbi. They apprenticed under a master rabbi that they learned from, and they were that master rabbi's disciples. The fact that Jesus had disciples was not significant. What was significant was that he expected them to stay together and to remain as disciples even after he ascended to heaven and left them. Dead rabbis usually didn't have disciples that stayed together. It's like, all right, our rabbi's dead. Let's all go our own ways and remember the inspirational things that he taught us and we learned a lot from him and that was great, but now we go our own ways. Jesus said, no, guys, I don't want you to do that. Father, keep them. Keep them together. But it's not just that, it's keep them connected to Jesus. Do you see the keeping work? First, it's connect them to Jesus, and then it's also to connect them to one another. And we need this keeping work. Friends, when Jesus prayed, Father, keep them, he didn't just pray it for the 11, he prays it for us. We need the keeping work of Jesus. We need it in our life. 
We need to be kept from division. That's why he says, Father, keep them that they may be one. We need to be kept from error. We need to be kept from sin. We need to be kept from hypocrisy. Friends, we need this keeping work of the Father in our life. And that's why Jesus prayed for his disciples and prayed for them so earnestly. But notice this. It's in verse 11 as well. He said specifically, keep through your name. What does he mean by that? Well, he didn't pray, keep through an angel or keep through a church leader or keep them through their own effort. The work of keeping a believer connected to their Savior and connected to one another. This work is so significant that it can only happen through the character and the name of God. A church program isn't enough to keep you. A charismatic preacher isn't enough to keep you. A plan, a strategy. What you need is you need the work of God in your life. And that's why Jesus prayed, God the Father, keep them. Look, we don't understand. Not everybody who starts out following Jesus continues it to the end. Isn't that true? We see people crash and burn in their faith. Sometimes they're famous people. We have kind of this weird thing in the Christian world today. We have this kind of phenomenon of the Christian celebrity. What a strange thing. I pretty much think there should be one Christian celebrity, and that's Jesus Christ. Beyond that, you know, just who needs it? But there are prominent people in the family of God, and when one of those crashes and burns, wow, it gets a lot of notice, doesn't it? We see it, and we stand up, and we take notice. We go, man, they didn't make it. And then there's just people we know personally. Sometimes people close to us, man, they didn't make it. I don't know what your reaction is to sometimes to those people who seem to crash and burn. I don't know if it ever enters your mind, well, they crash and burn, but I'm not. Listen, you and I, we all need the keeping power of Jesus. The job is too big for a church program. It's too big for your own efforts. It's too big for any of those things. We need the work of God in our life to keep us faithful after him. And that's why Jesus prays for this. Now, what does he pray for them in their keeping? Notice it there in verse 11. That they may be one as we are. The keeping work of God the Father and the disciples would not only keep them in Him, but it would also keep them connected to one another. Jesus prayed that they would be one. But notice, their unity had a pattern. Jesus says that they may be one as we are. Who's the we? The Father and the Son. And friends, that's very instructive. When we think of the unity of God the Father and God the Son, man, that's a unity, isn't there? There's nothing going to come between the Father and the Son. Man, they are together. They are united in will, in purpose, in heart, in work. However, they're not the same. The Father is the Father, and the Son is the Son. They're not the same. Friends, this is the pattern for unity among believers. We should be united in heart, in purpose, in spirit, in effort, but we're not going to be all the same. We don't believe in a kind of Christianity that's measured by everybody having the same personality, by everybody having the same interests, by everybody having the same gifts. That's not the point at all. We have our different personalities. We have our different interests. We're not interested in making a cookie-cutter Christianity. No, God has made us different, but we should all be able to come together unified under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And you know, I think it works. You, you should get to do what I do. You should get to stand up here and look at all your faces. And one of the things I think, beyond just gratitude, I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you that your people come together to worship you and hear your word. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. That is a good thing. Beyond that, one of the things I think is I think this. I think, Lord, what a strange collection of people. (laughs) Now, not that you individually are strange, although that may be the case. If the shoe fits, you can wear it. But the fact that we are all collected together, isn't it strange? You think about all the nations, all the languages, all the backgrounds. You think about people who come from high class, low class, no class? 
You think about all the people that we come together, we are a diverse, different group of people. And you know what? Yet we are all together in the family of God. And God doesn't say to us, you gotta all be the same. No, Jesus said, I want there to be unity among my people, but it doesn't have to be a uniformity. Make them one. Make them love one another, care about each other, respect one another, give to one another, but they don't have to be all the same to do that. That's God's will for his people. And Jesus says, no, while I was with them, verse 12, in the world, I kept them in your name, and I didn't lose any of them, except verse 12, he says, except for the son of perdition. There was one exception there of Jesus is keeping work, but even that was according to the scriptures. Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. Do you know what perdition is? Perdition, it's not a word that we use in normal conversation, but it's a word that means destruction. He's the son of destruction. He's completely destroyed. He's completely judged. Now verse 13. But now I come to you. Again, remember, this is Jesus praying to his father in the presence of the disciples in the upper room. Picture that scene in your mind. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Please notice this verse 13 that they, Jesus prayed, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus not only prayed, Lord, keep them connected to me. Jesus not only prayed, Lord, keep them connected to one another, but he also said, Lord, keep my joy in them. I want my joy to be fulfilled in them. Now, this tells us something about Jesus that sometimes we don't think about. It tells us that Jesus was a man filled with joy. We often don't think about that, do we? Now, why do I say that Jesus was a man filled with joy? Because if he was not filled with joy, this verse would make no sense. Why would Jesus pray that the disciples be filled with his joy if he didn't have any joy? If you think about a very discouraged, kind of depressed, kind of down person that you know, and if that person came to you and said, hey, I want to give you my joy. (laughs) No thank you, you'd say. Why don't you keep it? Now I'll find a happy person and get their joy. But no, Jesus, yes, it's true, friends. I don't want to diminish it. Isaiah chapter 53 says that Jesus was a man of sorrows well acquainted with grief. He knew what sorrow was. He knew what grief over sin and the brokenness of humanity was. I'm not trying to sell that short in the slightest way. Nevertheless, I think that Jesus, in some ways, was the happiest, most joyful man that ever walked this earth. I think that he knew joys and aspect of happiness in his life that you and I only have a dim shadow of. Jesus had a joyful life. He had the joy of unbreakable fellowship with God. Some of you, I understand it's not all of you, but some of you know what it's like to encounter God in worship or in the word or in a time of prayer in in a transcendent state that just, there's just such a joy and a peace and a goodness in it that it's striking. Think about it, Jesus had that all the time and in a measure greater than you and I would ever know. He had the joy of unbroken fellowship with God. He had the joy of complete faith and confidence in his Father. Do you know what that's like? Again, surely, many of you have experienced this. Many of you have had the experience of what it is God just fills you with, with a supernatural faith. And no matter what's going on, the world may be falling apart around you, but there's joy in your heart. Like, listen, I know it's all going to be okay. God told me so, and I can be at complete peace. If you could just remember, that just sort of the exhilaration of the joy in that moment, Jesus had that all the time, and in a greater measure than any of us would ever know. Jesus had the joy of seeing the great things God does. You ever see God do wonderful things? You go, man, this is amazing. This is great. 
Listen, Jesus knew that joy. He saw the greatness of God's work more clearly than anybody else. He had a joy that was never diminished by sin. It was never diminished by deception. It was never diminished by allowing even the smallest foothold to the devil. Jesus had joy, and he prayed that his joy would be real in the life of the disciples. He was so concerned about it that he made a special point to pray for it. Now, if I could just say very pointedly, some of you hear those words and you think, I am a thousand miles from that joy. I just invite you to pray a bold prayer. You can say it softly right now. You, you, you can pray it in the quietness of your heart, but I invite you to pray a very bold prayer. Say, Jesus, would you pray for me that I would have this joy? Would you pray for me that my life would be filled with this? Because I I don't think it's wrong for you to pray for that joy, but how much better it is for Jesus to pray for that joy for you? Isn't it possible that your prayers could be unanswered? I hope you think it's possible. But is it possible that the prayers of God the Son could be unanswered? No, say, Jesus, pray for me that I would have this joy. Now look at verse 15, because at verse 15, we come to something so key that we have to spend a little bit of time on it. At verse 15, he says this, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. And friends, Jesus was leaving this planet. Yes, he was going to go to the cross. Yes, he would go to the tomb. Yes, he would rise from the dead. And then 40 days after he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven. He was leaving this world. But Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I want you guys to stay behind. And he specifically prayed. Did you see the wording in verse 15? I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. It didn't necessarily have to be that way. Jesus could have said something like this to his disciples. Okay, guys, I'm going. Afterwards, I want you to hang together, but go out to the desert and establish your own community. You guys got to keep it holy. You got to keep it pure. Man, do not run elbows with the horrible people of this present age. You go out and do your own thing and stay in your own community. And if anybody wants a piece of what I have, they can come out to you. Jesus could have said that to his disciples. Many religious movements have done very similar things. But Jesus said, no, I do not want you to do that. I want you to get out and mix it up with the world. He said very deliberately, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Friends, Jesus wants us in this world. How else is the world going to have light? How else is the world going to have a witness? How else is the world going to have the truth and the love and the grace of Jesus? And by the way, where else is God going to work on our life to that same degree? You are in this world with all of its bumps, all of its bruises, all of its tests and troubles. You are in this world because God is using this world to prepare you for heaven. Did you think that purgatory was going to prepare you for heaven? (laughs) Friends, there is no purgatory. The Bible doesn't say a word about purgatory. The Bible says whatever preparation for heaven there will be in our lives happens right now while we are in this world. And I know it's tough. I know that there are evil people. I know that there are well-intentioned people who are wrong. I know that there are difficult people. I know all the problems in the world out there, or at least I know about them, even if I don't know them personally. But friends, I know this. God, if we will allow him, will use those things to prepare us for heaven. Jesus prayed, Father, keep them in this world. You know, there are certain men, I can think of Job, I can think of Moses, and I can think of Elijah. All three of those men, great men of God in the Old Testament, each one of them prayed, Lord, get me out of this world. Get me out of here. And God said to each one of them, nope, I'm not going to do it. My favorite one of those, I like talking about this one. You've probably heard me say this before. My favorite one of those is Elijah. Elijah was at a point in his life where he was so discouraged and so depressed, and for a good reason. There was a wicked, evil queen named Jezebel who made it her life's ambition to kill him. That would bum anybody out. Elijah was so depressed and so down that he said, Lord, just kill me. I'm no better than my father's. Lord, just kill me. And not only did God say no, God said no way. Because not only did he not take Elijah's life right then, God said to Elijah, just for that, you're never dying. I'm taking up to heaven alive. That was the most radical, unanswered prayer in the entire Bible. 
God says, no, I want you in this world. This is my purpose for you. He wants us to remain in the world. But, notice this in verse 15, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Father, I want them to be in the world, but I don't want them to be just like the world under the influence and the sway of the evil one. And you know who the evil one is that Jesus spoke of here. The evil one is Satan, the devil, the adversary. I wonder, I, I always imagine what it must be like for someone who doesn't believe that there is a devil to hear me, a preacher, talk about the devil. I wonder if they think, poor man, he seemed otherwise intelligent. <laughs> but now he goes off into fantasies about some guy, you know, with a pitchfork and uh, red tights or whatever. <laughs> L- listen, let me just put it to you this way. I know that intelligent people today oftentimes like to deny that there's Satan or devil. I'll just put it to you this way. Jesus apparently believed there was a devil. And if you're smarter than Jesus, well, good. We can have it. But Jesus believed there was a devil. And and he believed that it was important for him to pray that his people be kept from the power of the evil one. That his work in the world and upon the believer would not take root. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you how difficult it is to live for God in this present age. I think about the challenges that face a young man or a young woman in the world today. How difficult it is for them to stay pure and right with God. How difficult it is for them with all the passions that there are within, that the lusts that burn hot, with the pressure there is to conform to the world around them. The pressure for conformity seems to be stronger today than than I've ever sensed it in the world today. Oh, the the world knows how to sell it to you. The, The world basically says this, you should be different just like everybody else. They sell this kind of branded nonconformity to where you can be rebellious just the same way everybody else is rebellious. No, I think about all that and my heart goes out for young people today and I pray for them and we seek to minister and we go, listen, it's that, but, but. Then I start thinking about older people. I start thinking about people my age. Listen, older people, I'm speaking to you right now. Don't you think that the big problems and and, and yielding to passions and lusts and the crashing and the burning. Don't you think for a minute that that just belongs to the young age? It might even belong more so to those older people. Can I give you an example? When you see people in the Bible that crash and burn, it's almost always older people. Young Joseph resisted temptation. Young David walked with God. But what did old David do? He went after Bathsheba. It's oftentimes the case. No, 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 every one of us, young or old, young believer or seasoned believer, every one of us need the keeping power of Jesus in our life. We need to remain in the world, but be kept from the power of the evil one. Because Jesus says, look at verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Because Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, Lord, they belong to me, so they don't really belong to this world. They're not of the world, but they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Friends, there are weird ways to not be of the world. Do we understand that? You you look at somebody who's a madman, who's out of his mind who's raving up and down the streets of Santa Barbara. You look at that person and say, you know what? They're not of this world. But Jesus didn't say that it was important for believers to be not of the world just for the sake of not being of the world. No, that's not it at all. Please notice the phrasing there in verse 16. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Jesus' being not of the world Was it being not of the world full of grace and love and compassion? He was not of the world, but not in a weird way, but in a way that says, I am separate from the corruptions, from the the folly, from the unbelief of an ungodly age. 
but I am connected to the world in love and grace and mercy. If there is a pattern for our being not of the world, we need to be not of the world in the same way that Jesus was not of the world. That's our call. That's our charge. Now let's conclude our time with a look at these last three short verses, 17, 18, and 19. Again, Jesus continues his prayer. And he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Notice that phrasing Jesus used in verse 17. He said, sanctify them by your truth. Sanctify means to be set apart for God's special pleasure and special purpose. It implies holiness, purity, being free from the corruption of the world, but being set aside also for God's use. It's not just a negative thing, it's also a positive thing. You're set apart from some things, but you're set apart to or for other things. Do you get that connection? I like the way that the New Living Translation puts this. It reads like this. Verse 17 reads, Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. That's a big part of what it means to be sanctified. Simply being pure and holy, but by His words of the truth. Two things to notice. Jesus fundamentally looked to the work of the Father to sanctify His people. Now, I know that it happens with our participation. It's not like you go to bed at night and say, Father, in the morning, through this night, just make me sanctified and pure. That's not how he does it. But he does it in our life through the events where we work with him and his work is active. But don't think that sanctification is something that you do for God. It's something he does in and through you. God doesn't do sanctification to you but he does it in you and through you. And what's one of the main ways he uses? Friends, look at verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I believe, and I believe it because the scriptures teach it. Jesus says it right here, that there is something in the word of God that brings purity, that brings holiness into our life, that God's word, when we take it, when it is read, when it's heard, when it's understood, when it's applied, God's word makes us pure and holy. This is how he works in our life. Now again, I'm not saying that God's word like some magical potion. You can't take a Bible and say, I'm going to carry a Bible with me every day and then I'll be sanctified. If it's in your pocket, it doesn't do you so much good. If it's in your mind and your heart and your life, then it'll do you a lot of good. But friends, this is why, this is why we do one of the great things we do at our congregational meetings, why we give so much attention to the Bible and God's very words. It's different than what's done in the world at large. Don't you think it's strange? I doubt that anybody has an appointment later on this afternoon or tonight to go study the wars of Caesar with several hundred other people together in one room. Yet here we are together talking about a 2,000-year-old book like it really matters. Why? Because it does. Because there's something different about this book. It's truth. And God does a work in our life as we give attention to this truth. That's why it's so important. That's why it's such a wonderful thing for you and I to come together and give a focus on this. And this is why, friends, why we as a church, why as we as a congregation in the preaching, why we give an emphasis to the words of the Scripture itself. I don't stand before you and say, i got to think of a really clever speech to deliver to those people. Now, to some of you, it's obvious. I'm not trying to do that. What I consider myself to be is a messenger of God's truth because I think there's power in these very words of God. And part of that power 
is to sanctify us by his truth. I hope that nobody misunderstands me. I do not believe for a moment that the entirety of the Christian life is a Bible study. I don't believe that everything in the Christian world or in discipleship can be solved by a Bible study. I don't believe that. But I believe that there is a large and a prominent place for the work of the Word of God in the life of any disciple. And that's one of the things we rejoice in together here at Calvary Chapel. Now look at this, verse 18. He says, As you sent me into the world... I also have sent them into the world. Father, keep them, sanctify them, but I'm sending them into the world. Notice this. Jesus didn't merely leave his disciples when he went to heaven. He didn't leave them. He sent them. That's a pretty big difference between the two, don't you think? Leaving is just by, fend for yourselves, hope you get along okay. Sending is, I got a job for you guys to do. Get out there and do it. And friends, I believe with all my heart that when Jesus sent those 11, he wasn't just speaking about them, he's speaking about us. We are also sent. Matter of fact, this is where we get our whole idea of missions, missional living, anything you want to call it along those lines. The word in Latin for to send is missio. We get our word missions or missionary from that. It's directly from this idea of being sent out. And that's what Jesus says about all of his disciples. Not just a few that go to the foreign field, though thank God for them. But for every one of us, whatever we do every day, it's because we're sent by Jesus Christ. And please notice this. This is thrilling. He says in verse 18, You sent me into the world. I also have sent them into the world. We are sent as Jesus was sent. Now, if you'll think for a moment at how Jesus came into the world and realize that's how God sends you, how life-changing that is. Jesus did not come as a philosopher like Plato or Aristotle. He could have. Don't you think Jesus could have taught some amazing philosophy courses? But he didn't come that way. Jesus did not come as an inventor or a discoverer, even though he could have invented and discovered so many things. What if Jesus would have bust out the smartphone, 33 AD? That would have been leaving some people scratching their heads. You think you have a hard time getting coverage on your phone now? Just try it back then. Jesus could have done that, but he didn't. No, that's not why he came. Jesus did not come as a conqueror, even though he is mightier than Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great put together. He could have come in all those ways, as a philosopher, as a discoverer, as a conqueror. But no, he said, I'm going to come a different way. I'm going to come to teach. I'm going to come to live among them. I'm going to come to suffer for truth and righteousness. I'm going to come to rescue men and women for a kingdom to come. That is how I'm sent. That's how I send forth my people. Friends, this is what we have. We have our marching orders. Look at how Jesus was sent That's how we are sent. And that's why Jesus says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. I'm set apart for this purpose. I'm set apart to the cross. I'm set apart to fulfill that work in every sense. Well, we have to pause right here. We don't have enough time to finish this prayer. Although I should say, next week, next week we see where Jesus deliberately prays for the disciples who would come after the 11. I don't know if there's anybody here that fits that description. I think I'm looking out on a whole bunch of them. I think in general, what we talked about applies to us because we are disciples, but specifically Jesus prays for us in the next time. It's gonna be thrilling. But that's for next week. Let's just close by reminding ourselves of these things. We are kept, we are preserved in the world, not to escape from the world. Secondly, we are kept, we're preserved from the world, we're to be pure and holy and not like the world. But third, we're kept and we're preserved for the world so that we can be sent forth into a needy world just as Jesus was. Father, we pray 
We pray that you would hear and answer the prayers of the Son of God for us in the way that goes beyond anything we can think. We understand that Jesus prays for us. He didn't stop praying in the upper room on that night. So Jesus, even now, we ask that you would keep us. Keep us in the world. Keep us from becoming of the world. Send us forth into the world, Lord. Keep and preserve your people. We need this, Lord. It's too big of a job for us to do ourselves. But you can and you have and you will do it in us. We love you, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.